sometimes we just had enough and we're going to push back against what's been pushing against us. I think that's a natural tendency in all of us that we take so much ridicule, we take so much of despising that are really not founded upon truth but upon prejudice that sometimes we're ready to hit back a little bit, push back a little bit. And yet we're warned of God that we're not to return evil for evil, we're to speak the truth in love, and we must follow that particular aspect of the Christian that God places upon us, even when we are pushing back. Apostle Paul is a great example of this. We're going to examine this morning. When you turn our Bibles, we turn our Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter in verse 14, we are looking at a discussion of what is a natural man. We want to investigate that, but I want you to see from the outset, this is pushback time. And the Apostle Paul is driving home a point, but it's in a context of pushing back on behalf of the spiritual in this context who have the mind of Christ. And it's interesting to me that we will look at two areas of our faith that is being despised by the natural man. And that is our salvation in Jesus Christ who was put to death so we could live and the bodily resurrection from the dead. It's what brings us to Christ, what lies into our future as a Christian. And the natural man will consider all of that foolishness. And you'll see that from Scripture. And what Paul is doing to the Christian is giving that Christian a firm place to stand. And it's pushback time. It's addressing the natural man. And we'll see that in this reading because he says, verse 15, He that is spiritual judgeth all things, and he himself is judged of no man. Pushback time. But who knows the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? Pushback time. We have the mind of Christ. No apology made. And while we're living in a world that despises Christianity in a lot of places, people make fun of Christians, they hate Christians, they're trying to annihilate Christians from the public square and from people to have any idea of what that might be. We look at the natural man and realize that it's time to not only understand who he is, but to have a little pushback on those who think like he does. Who is the natural man? Some would say, well, it's a man that is totally depraved. He's a man that cannot, when you read the Bible to him, he cannot perceive it because he's dead in sin. That he needs the Holy Spirit to enlighten him and to illuminate his mind so he can receive the gospel. That's the natural man. And they do, when he says the Holy Spirit receives those things, they're, they're foolishness to him. And Paul says that. He cannot know them. See, he's unable to know them. He's not able to do that. Because they're spiritually discerning. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. That's the way some interpret the passage. It's not that the Spirit, a man that is so depraved that he cannot understand when the gospel is preached to him, that he needs that being born again by the Holy Spirit so he can now see what to do to be saved. Paul's not under that discussion. He's talking about things that are revealed and revealed by the mind of God through Scripture. That's the context. And by the way, a little pushback time. In John 20 and verse 30 and 31, John says, 
that there are many other signs that Jesus do in his presence of the disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written. You read what's written. That ye may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that believing, you may have life in his name. That means I'm not, I don't have life yet when I read. Because that's what I'm going to have. And the word of God is there, written down. I didn't have to experience the miracle. I just read about the fact of when it occurred. And I read those eight miracles in John. I read about the many miracles that he did in the Gospels. And they're driving me, who is not saved yet, who doesn't even believe yet, to believe. Because I read what's written. And through that belief, I can have life in my name. Where did I need the illumination, the miraculous illumination of the power of the Holy Spirit? <coughs> Pushback time. The truth is the Holy Spirit has revealed Scripture so we can know that. In 2 Peter, the first chapter, and verse 3, Seeing that by his divine power he hath granted all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness because we know them. Because they come by his divine power of revealing the scripture. Paul says, when you read what I've written in Ephesians 3, 3 through 5, you will understand my understanding of the mystery. You'll perceive my understanding in the mystery, which is indeed salvation for the Gentiles. When you read, you'll understand. When you read, you'll believe. And you respond to what you read because you understand them. That's what drives you to obey the gospel. And we can have life in his name. Isn't that the context of 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14? That God, not miraculously working the Holy Spirit upon us, but we know things through what's written? Beginning with verse 10 of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, leading up to our verse 14 of the natural man. Apostle Paul indeed makes that point. But unto us God revealed them. Through the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For who among men knoweth the things of a man, say the Spirit of the man, which is in him. Even so the things, God, uh, uh, things of God none knoweth, say the Spirit of God. But we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Spirit teacheth, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. Now the natural man doesn't receive those things. Why? Because he's not inspired? It's because he doesn't have the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit working upon him? No. It's revealed. And he says it's foolish. He's made a judgment. When some... Read what's revealed, and they become spiritual. It's how we react to the revealed scriptures. Because through the scripture, he didn't hide things through this New Testament scripture. He's revealing things so we can know the things that come from God. And it's the Spirit of God that revealed them to the apostles by revelation, which indeed he speaks and he writes so we can know. That's the context. The natural man hears Christ being preached. He said that's foolishness. That's the natural man. And that deals with our salvation. Isn't that the context of 1 Corinthians 1 and 2? He thinks these are foolish? What things? <laughs> Verse chapter 1 and verse 18, For the word of the cross is to them that perish. Foolishness. A little pushback time. Well, we don't know if they're going to perish or not. They just, they just don't receive it. They're perishing. He's not making any apologies. There's no gray area here. He's perishing. But he says it's foolishness. Drop down to verse 23. 
But we preach Christ crucified unto Jews a stumbling block, unto Gentiles foolishness. Jews are not going to accept it. Gentile says foolish. That's the natural man. What's been revealed, they made a judgment about it. The message of salvation through Christ and the cross is understood. I hear what you're saying, Paul, but I'm rejecting it because I'm the natural man. That's how Paul paints his picture. It's not that he's gifted miraculously of the Holy Spirit. It's what the Holy Spirit miraculously revealed to the apostles. He's made a judgment about that. So God's saving message is foolishness to him because it goes against what he thinks it ought to be. It goes against his pride, his power, his prestige. Don't we see that in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 26? For behold your calling, brethren, that not many wise after the flesh not many mighty, not many noble are, ca are called, but God shows the foolish things of the world that he might put to shame them that are wise, and God shows the weak things of the world that he might put to shame the things that are strong. Notice not many wise according to this world, not many noble, they're, they're prestigious people, they're people in power. Did you notice that not many of them are called? What do we mean by called? Well, God doesn't call them because they're not going to be God's people. No. God calls us to the gospel, whether we're rich or poor. These are the people that have heeded the call. Isn't that what we see in verse 24? But them that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God. It is the wisdom of God. Those who have received the call of the gospel are those that said, Christ crucified, I know you think that's foolishness, but that's, that's power. I know you think that's weakness, but that's God's way of power over sin. And that's the wisdom of God you think is foolish. I've received that call. I have the mind of Christ. I'm spiritual man in this case. But the natural man, why? Because... That's not the way he thinks it ought to be. That's foolish just for your God to die on the cross. Why would you serve him? And modern man today, one of the arguments of atheists is the fact that we serve Jesus and we follow a bloody religion. It's bloody. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. All that blood in the Old Testament. And Jesus Christ shed his blood. His blood redeems us from our sins. That's bloody. I don't want anything to do with blood. That's the modern thinking. That's one of the arguments of atheists. It's pushback time. That's just the truth. Make no apologies for the Lamb of God. It takes away the sin of the world. That Lamb of God, the Old Testament was realizing here that can't take away your sins but Christ did crucifixion that's gaudy and yet that's the way God chose to kill his son yes God killed his son so we could live he did it through the hands of unrighteous men and there's never apology for that the natural man said, that just doesn't fit with me, so I don't want anything to do with it. You're perishing. That's the pushback. And Paul never allows you to mistake that. You're perishing. Because that's the only message that will ever save you. But the natural man says, that's foolishness. Let's talk about the resurrection. Remember Acts, the 17th chapter? Paul goes into Athens. They love to hear any new thing. But look how they reacted that when Paul preached about the resurrection. Certain also the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encounter him and said, What would this babbler say? That is a word denoting seed picker. Nothing of depth. 
to him. He's plucking the seeds out of the ground. I know my dad, but sometimes we've joked about it. That somebody ever tell you that's top water preaching? That's not a compliment. That's top water preaching. Better be careful. They say it's pretty shallow. He's a seed picker. He's a babbler. What is he preaching? He's preaching the resurrection. The fact of a bodily resurrection one day. And that's what he's preaching. What does this babbler say? Others seem it to be a set of forth. He said for strange gods because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. Look at verse 32. Talk about the natural man thinking these things are foolishness. What about the resurrection? When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, who will hear thee concerning this yet again? They're going to listen again. But some mocked. You know, if you can say sarcastic words and you can just make mockery of it, then you've defeated the argument. Pushback time. You ain't touched it. It didn't change the validity of it just because you mocked it. And what does our modern man do? They mock God. They mock Christianity. And people want to shy back. Not Paul. Because it is indeed the truth. Paul saw this division between the, the Jewish sects, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees. In Acts 23 and, and verse 8, notice he said the Sadducees says there is no resurrection. And of course, Paul knew that the Pharisees believed that. So he, would divide the, he divides the audience a little bit. Because no Pharisee is going to believe like a Sadducee. For the Sadducees say, because he's speaking about the resurrection, the Sadducees said there is no resurrection. Neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. I've got three things. How come you say both? You just said the resurrection, and you got no angels and no spirit, and the Pharisees confess both. That means two. And he just spoke about two things. What lies in our future is the resurrection. And that immaterial part of reality called angelic spirits that are apart from any bodily substance, they're angels, they're spirits. And the fact that we have something separate from our physical bodies. It's not our brain, it's our soul, it's our spirit. Well, I can't see there that, so it doesn't exist. That's foolishness. We realize there is a spiritual part. That's what Nicodemus needed to learn. Am I going to have to get back in my mother's womb to be born again? You said you've got to be born again. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is of the flesh is flesh. That which is of the spirit is spirit. There's a part of you, Nicodemus, that needs to be born again. And you may not feel the emptiness of spirit in your soul. You may think living this life of this world, living for now, is all there is to it. And that may be all that you're interested in. And so if someone thinks about something strange, you may mock them. He's just a seed picker. But it doesn't change the reality of the truth. And I just make mention, you read the 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and you'll say Paul pushes back. What kind of body will it have? What's the nature of that body? He says, you're a foolish one. Pushback time. You're the foolish one. When you plant a seed, it's not the same thing that appears as a plant. <laughs> What you put in the ground, it changes and comes forth from there, different from what was put in there. And you think, I can't give you a different body? Look at your garden you plant. Look at the flesh, flesh of beasts and flesh of man, flesh of, flesh of birds, flesh of, 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 of flesh of fish. God's brought that together. He, he can diversify. And you telling me, how can the body be a new body? <laughs> Fools. Foolish one. 
And the point is, is that there is going to be a resurrection and this God will give it a spiritual body that pleases him. And Paul does a little pushback. Thou foolish one to ask that question. When you look at creation, you look at how you get your food, look up at the stars, look around you and see the different flesh in God's creation. You tell me, how does God give it different bodies? So when we look at salvation from sin and the idea of salvation from the grave, what happens is that when we see the spiritual part of person that is going to not be the natural man, he is going to take and receive that. And so he's able to judge all things. 1 Corinthians 2.15 He realizes what situation he is in but for a, a holy God. So the spiritual man judges all things. How can he do that? Because he knows the eternal plan of God, of salvation. Notice in 1 Corinthians 2, 8 and 9, leading up to verse 10, which was revelation of, the, of God's mind through the word. Notice what did not enter into the heart of man, which none of the, which none of the rulers of this world had known, for had he they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but has written the things that the eye saw not, the things that ear heard not, which enter not in the heart of man, which sort of things God prepared for them that loved him, but God revealed them. And natural man said, that's foolishness. This plan did not originate with man. If it did, they wouldn't have put to death the Lord of glory. But that's just fulfilling God's plan. And we know that eternal plan because of what has been revealed through the Word of God. We know the glories that awaited us in heaven. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, in verse 11, we'll find that the prophets, they were indeed presenting the message that would come when Christ fulfills it. And they were prophesying things they didn't really know, but they were speaking the truth of the coming of Christ. Searching what time or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did point unto when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow them. Salvation from our sin after Christ was crucified. But not only that, the glories of heaven and he tells you what they are in verse 3 and 4, really what they're not. It's incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. That's our living hope. How do you know that? Because God's revealed it. And either you're going to be a natural man who said that's foolishness. Or you're going to receive it. And there is the spiritual man. I know the eternal plan of God for salvation from sin. I know the glories that await for me in heaven. And those are the two things that a natural man says, I don't want anything a part of that. It does not interest me whatsoever. And Paul says, it's still the truth. And you can mock it. You can ridicule it. You can reject it. <laughs> There's not many people like you obey the call of the gospel anyway. But it doesn't change the fact that you're perishing. See, the spiritual is, fat, is kind of pushback time. He said, the spiritual is judged by no man. There's a little pushback. Judged by no man. And we see this with Paul. When he is, when Festus hears him preach, and King Agrippa is listening. And Festus says, that much learning hath made thee mad. That's a little ridicule, isn't it? You're crazy, Paul. There's your natural man. Push back. I'm not mad. Most excellent Festus. He didn't call him the scum of the earth. He didn't call him an idiot. He recognized his place. See, don't do evil for evil. They call you a seed picker? Won't you have something funny to say about Festus? He recognized his place and he pushed back. I'm not mad, most excellent Festus. I don't think the things done have been done in secret with Agrippa. Agrippa have seen that. 
You believe it's not the prophets, Agrippa? I know you believe us. Because thou fain make me a, that would fain with a little persuasion, that would make fain make me a, a Christian. He said, I would that everybody hearing me would be like I am, except without these bonds. Paul, in a very respectful way, pushes back with the truth. Just because they called him crazy didn't change the facts of the matter. Wonder if they don't receive what you preach. Wonder if they're, uh, they're not going to receive what well, that's the natural man. May never do that. But it doesn't change what I am before God. Here's a little pushback for the Christian. Here's a little strength to give the Christian that's been browbeated and ridiculed. We are a sweet savor of Christ unto God in them that are saved and in them that perish. For one is a savor from death to death. They didn't change a bit. But it didn't change me either. To the other, a savor from life unto life. Who is sufficient for these things? Oh, we're not like those who corrupt the word of God. We're going to keep preaching the truth. We're going to keep setting forth the truth. But as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Paul had the mind of Christ when he describes the one who's spiritual. We are a sweet savor. No, you're a nut. You're, that's foolish stuff. Our salvation from sin by Christ crucified, an idea of a bodily resurrection one day. Paul never backs off that. He said, We are a sweet savor of Christ unto God. You can rule kill us in public, and we can be the, 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 the bottom thing of the world, the scum of the earth. But I'm telling you what the truth is. And you're going to die in your sins if you don't believe it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, not only does he speak about his salvation in Christ through Christ crucified as he does to Agrippa and Festus and to the Corinthians. But he says this about the resurrection. If we have only hoped in Christ in this life, we are men most pitiable. That means we are object of pity. If we've only hoped in this life about Christ. Oh, he saved me from my sins. And I'm, I'm going to live the life of a Christian. And I don't know about that resurrection from, from the grave. I'm just going to live the best life. If we've only hoped in Christ in this life, listen to Paul. He not backing down. He said, if that's all you have, just, I've been saved, and I'm going to live a good life now, and God, God, God sheds his blessings upon us. When I'm dead, it's over with. It's been good life. We are men most pitiable. And yet, what is praised? Pascal's wager. Paul is depending upon the revealed mind of God. That certainty. He doesn't argue. Place your bets. Because if there is no God and you live as a Christian this life, you'll forfeit very little. Oh, you may not have as much fun. There'll be some things you had to give up. You may lose that. But the wiser bet would be to follow Christ in this life. Because if it is true, you're going to go to hell. You're going to lose your soul for eternity in hell. And this was a 17th century way of doing apologetics for God. And it may impress worldly-minded people today. I don't condemn you for using it. Because if it's just about a, making a bet, that's about all they're going to do. 
But I want you to be anchored in God and realize God speaks to Paul in its certainty. And Paul never backs off of that. We are men most pitiable now if that's all we do. Hope in Christ in this life. What Paul knows is certainty is going to take place. There's the battle between the spiritual man that says, I accept what God revealed and I submit to it. Christ crucified and Christ resurrected from the grave. And we need to be strengthened by that. When people ridicule the Bible, ridicule the life of a Christian, have disparaging remarks about your faith, Call it a bloody religion. Call it just pie in the sky. And idea you're thinking about heaven, not really thinking about how to better man upon this earth. Those things are not true. But all of the mockery should not cause us to realize, well, I, I'm just not certain about my faith any longer. Mockery never changes the truth. A lot of times people are mocking because they're scared to death that it is the truth. And they're not walking that way. So they mock it. Make fun of it. Maybe it'll go away. Paul says it's not going away. He's going to preach that truth. And he'll be a sweet savor to Christ. In death. That people reject it. He's still a sweet savor. Or hopefully in life. And I hope that you will not be the natural man. Because the natural man is not the fellow that is all buffed up with muscles and taking and eating herbs, and that's the natural man. It's not a Neanderthal fall man who maybe looks like, well, he's half animal and half man. That's a natural man. It's not the natural man that just has hair all over his body. That's not the natural man. The natural man who's exposed to the Word of God so that's foolishness to me. I want no part of it. That's the natural man. I don't care what you look like. Little hair, no hair. Eat herbs or cheeseburgers. I don't know. It's still the natural man is that spiritual condition. And what I'm saying is that Paul, with due respect to people who mocked him, you haven't changed the truth. And he's speaking the truth. That Jesus died for your sins. He was raised for your justification. And because he's raised, you're going to be raised from the grave. It takes away the fear of death. It takes away the fear of facing a holy God. And that's God. He will not change it. And one day we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ, give an answer what we've done in the body. Will you say, I thought you didn't exist? And a lot of times I thought there was just foolishness what you said, what they said about you. You have an opportunity to obey that gospel. Get right with God as we stand and as we sing.